All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna get started on time, so we have ample time for Q&A. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Gloria Dominguez Bello, the Henry Rutgers Professor of Microbiome and Health in the Departments of Micro Biochemistry, Microbiology, and Anthropology at Rutgers University. Uh, Dr. Bello's training spans three continents, from South America to Europe to North America. And her beginnings were a degree in biology at the University of Simon Bolivar in Venezuela, where she trained under Mike Robinson, who got her interested in ecology. And just by wonderful chance, uh, Dr. Robinson is actually able to join us here today. Um, and uh, they reconnected after her undergraduate training that brought her into understanding ecological um, perspectives, which have been so instrumental in, um, in all of the incredible impact that your body of work has had. So from Venezuela, she went on to degrees in animal nutrition and microbiology at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. She uh, did a series of postdocs in France and then Spain. Um, particularly notable is the Marie Curie Postdoctoral Fellowship at the National Institute of Agronomic Research in France. And she began her professorial career in the, uh, at the University of Puerto Rico before then going to the NYU School of Medicine. Now, um, if you've had the opportunity to look at the, uh, Dr. Dominguez Bello's CV, you will see that she has written dozens of important and influential articles, has been recognized with numerous awards and honors, and has really created a body of work uh, that we're gonna hear a partial piece of today that really demonstrates uh, the strength of integrative, nuanced, experimental, observational, and uh, cross-disciplinary work. So her work understanding the uh, dynamics between microbes and their hosts through an evolutionary lens, particularly in the context of maternal and child health, has been really important for understanding the ways in which certain lifestyles or contexts have perturbed the microbiome away from what might be characterized as wild type, and then also finding ethical and appropriate ways to explore ways of recovering more uh, co-evolved, diverse microbiomes, but not in ways that further deteriorate uh, healthcare support and, and asymmetries. So uh, on that note, I would um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Professor Gloria Dominguez Bello to present to us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Randy, for the opportunity to visit your wonderful institution. Uh, for me, it's a new state. It's my uh, first time I visit Arizona, and we plan, Marty and I plan to take a weekend to admire the beauties that I only know by photographs and that Marty knows uh, many years ago that he came. So thank you for being here. I've changed a little the title of the talk, uh, The Early Microbiota in an Age of Dis Disruptive uh, Change, which I think uh, better fits the content of the talk. So the microbiota represents, uh, really challenges our uh, concept of who we are. It's a co-evolved self entity, vertically transmitted, non-self body of genomes. And these uh, microbes, these uh, genomes, uh, colonize and exert uh, functions in the epithelia of the body. The epithelium is the interface between us and the exterior. So the location where they colonize is, is uh, in between any interactions with the environment will cross this, bar this uh, barrier, this interface. And we know now how site-specific are each one of the microbial communities. In this case, this is bacteria. Uh, bacterial communities are uh, in the body, in the human body. And we are learning more and more how uh, these, uh, their functions are ex essential for nutrition, immunity, epithelial integrity, brain and behavior. We also know, uh, at least there is a 
I think majority consensus, this is an area where some controversy exists, but nobody has shown enough evidence that there is life uh, colonization inside the body in immune protected uh, spaces. So when do we acquire our life microbiota? When are we colonized? Uh, we think the uterus is a no, no life. Uh, there may be microbial DNA, like in the blood, but there is no colonization in uh, under, that's why we evolve by an immune system. So we know that the massive exposure to live microbes uh, occurs during labor. Babies are already born heavily colonized with the microbiota of the birth canal. And what happens after in all mammals is after that natural exposure, the environment of the baby naturally should be highly maternal. The baby uh, touches the mom's skin, the mother kisses the baby, and during strict lactation, the, envir the external environment of that baby is going to be heavily influenced by the mother. And then in the human species, they, in they go into a phase of very deep interaction with the environment. And that's nicely represented in this beautiful baby. Uh, they grab everything to the mouth. In our society, we impact every single stage of this development. Pregnant moms first undergo immunological and hormonal changes. And we know that they change the microbiota both in the vagina and in the um, intestine in ways that probably are adaptive. Probably the body is preparing for seeding the baby. Uh, the location of the birth canal and the rectum is always adjacent in any mammal species. Not, not so the uh, orifice for urination. So it's a, it's a constant that in any species, the, uh, the orifice through which the baby is born and the, and the fecal orifice are adjacent, which is not uh, casual. It's probably adaptive. And then babies get the founding inoculum for life, which mammals uh, will enrich via, via milk during the baby development and maturation of the baby systems. Uh, so in our society, we used no, a number of antimicrobial practices, uh, of which antibiotics are obviously major uh, impacts, major uh, factors. And we use antibiotics before, uh, during pregnancy, uh, in C-section, in one-third of vaginal deliveries because of mothers being strep B positive. In this country, the practice is to give antibiotics during birth, not so in other countries in Europe. And then often, oftentimes, uh, there is formula feeding or express milk feeding, uh, more antibiotics, and this is a, a compounded uh, perturbation, one after another. I study in particular C-section, and C-section is known to increase the risk of these modern diseases, which are the modern plagues. Asthma, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, obesity, and others are the same diseases that are associated with other uh, factors, such as antibiotics. So we think perturbation perinatally, and we hypothesize that the microbiome uh, might be involved. In terms of uh, obesity, for example, uh, there are epidemiological associations between c being born by C-section and having increased risk for obesity at one year or at seven years. And this is work by um, Noel Mueller, uh, with whom we are collaborating in a clinical trial I'll mention. We reported some years ago, how are babies different if they are born differently, by vaginally or by C-section. And here we have a principal coordinate analysis where each ball represents a sample, a microbiome. So we can see the maternal samples are oral in green 
uh, vaginal in red and skin in dark purple. And anybody side of the babies will cluster with the vaginal if the babies were born vaginally and with skin if babies were born by C-section. This uh, work opened my interest in the built environment and how, where are these babies getting their skin microbes? So we have done uh, studies in operating rooms and houses and studying how we seed our built environment mostly with skin bacteria. And that's what the operating rooms are filled with because otherwise they are very clean from environmental bacteria. So that is at birth. They are very different. Then with time, babies converge greatly at the community level, but there are populations that are markers of mode of birth. And Bacteroides, I brought it here, uh, is one of them. Bacteroides in C-section born in red remain low, at least during the first year of life. Uh, and this was work by Bokulik, uh, who was uh, working at Marty's lab, and we collaborated in following up these babies for two years. And other independent studies have also shown how bacteroides is depleted in C-section born babies in relation to vaginal. So we find a population that is a marker. On the other hand, there is a very interesting phenomenon, and is that alpha diversity, which at, at birth is higher in babies born by C-section, perhaps because the alpha diversity of the skin community is very high, they very rapidly um, join, uh, converge with the alpha diversity of uh, the vaginally born, but you can tell them apart again after 10 months. And this is something we don't understand why. You can tell apart much easier uh, babies that are uh, by the mode of birth after 10 months than before. So I'm an ecology in part thanks to Mike. So I said, you know, there are lots of C-sections that are needed for bad luck. In Latin America, there are lots of C-sections that are not needed and that are, are being chosen by the mothers, by the doctors, Brazil being the best example. Uh, guess what is the proportion of C-sections in Rio de Janeiro? Give me your highest number. 50. Higher. 80 to 1. Higher. 90. Over 90 percent. So it, and this is an interesting sociological phenomenon. In Brazil, people are opting, it's part of the culture, of avoiding natural birth for many reasons that are really worth to a matter of study for sociologists. And so we decided, well, why don't we do restoration ecology? So we, we, took, um, we, we took vaginal fluids from the mother in a gauze inserted in a tampon. And as soon as the baby born by C-section was born, we clean that baby with that vaginal swab. These were healthy pregnancy, healthy babies. Uh, most, the, the majority uh, reason for C-section was malposition presentation or repeated C-sections. And I decided to go out with a pilot study in part because this was very shocking to the medical community. Uh, when I presented the preliminary results, there was a very strong reaction against this uh, by the OBGYNs and some neonatologists. So I'm showing here the differences in uh, source tracking analysis, bacterial uh, sources uh, from different body sites in neonates. And let's see the first column. These are vaginally delivered babies during the first month of life in the anal, oral, and skin sites. And the sources are red for anal, uh, dark green for oral, clear green for skin, and our source of interest, vaginal, in purple. So we can see that babies born vaginally have the vaginal source of microbes everywhere, especially represented in a high proportion in the skin. That was the skin of the arm. C-sections lack that signal of vaginal source, 
and restoring, and the numbers are tiny, so this is a pilot study. The, we wanted to go out just to deliver the message that if you expose a, a sterilely born baby that will get uh, exposed to skin bacteria mostly, mostly to, if you expose that baby to vaginal bacteria, vaginal bacteria will, will engraft. Some of the taxa that were restored are appearing green in relation to vaginal babies or C-section, include the bacteroides, which I show you that tends to remain low during the first year uh, of life, lactobacillus in different uh, sites, and S24-7. So after this study, uh, an increased number of mothers asked to their babies to be seeded. seeded. The term seeding was invented by the Australian. And now, if you ask pregnant moms, a lot of them will know what seeding your baby is. So there has been a reaction that urges for more studies to really determine not only that we can normalize the microbiota, but really, does it matter? Are the babies uh, protected against the increased risk of diseases? That's a very expensive study, and we are uh, putting together, we have started uh, the clinical, uh, clinical trial we call PRIMED, uh, Primordial Restoration of Infant Microbiome and Development, with the aim of looking at the effects of vaginal seeding on um, Zeta score BMI, uh, markers of, of obesity, and it's a randomized clinical trial uh, of a vaginal microbiota versus a sham a swab, all babies born vaginally, the same um, very stringent selection uh, of uh, inclusion criteria. These, uh, the uh, um, FDA called us and asked that we needed an IND, which we did. So they considered this is a drug. Uh, it's like a new drug. We said, as whatever you say, they, you know, we said, we argue, we are not doing the intervention. The intervention is a C-section. We are trying to restore at least the exposure of the birth canal uh, with the gauze. So, but they said, you are giving the bacteria to the babies. It's not happening naturally. We said, fine, what do we need to do? So basically, we need to repeat all the tests, vaginal tests to check that the mother is healthy, has no... Uh, infections, uh, which we are doing. We are only starting. We need the money. This is a $10 million project, but we have started with the little money we have. Uh, we can cover 50 babies, and then we will see. So a randomized design in um, epidemiology can get con you know, conclusive results on causation. But there are also other ways to show whether C-section is causing the disease and whether restoration protects. And for that, we can use mice. So Keith Martinez, a graduate student in my lab at NYU, uh, took pregnant Swiss Webster, let them give birth or not. He did C-sections with fostering because we could never achieve survival C-sections. We tried. It's very hard. Uh, so he did C-section and fostered, uh, and then he followed the early microbiota and the growth and body mass. And we showed in uh, a couple of years ago how the C-section born grows significantly faster, bigger, in relation to vaginally born mice. The phenotype was stronger in females than in males, but uh, anyway, significant. Now, I told you that these guys were born by C-section and foster. So when we saw the phenotype and published, we said, let's repeat the experiment. This time, including the vaginal delivery and foster and restoring the C-section born with vaginal fluids from the mothers. Uh, he did that, and in this new experiment, he again shows that vaginally born and foster grow the biggest and the uh, fostering alone has almost no, no effect in females and an intermediate effect in males. 
and restoration held an intermediate phenotype in both males and females. So restoration at least partially protects. Exposing C-section born to microbes from the mother uh, at least partially protects against excessive weight gain. The microbiota was different, and basically, in red, you have the C-section foster, and in the, the rest of the colors are the vaginal, vaginal foster, or C-section restoration, the three groups of baby mice that saw vaginal bacteria, either because they were born naturally or because they were exposed. And they cluster apart. We also did um, gene expression in the intestine. So there were 40 differentially expressed genes in the intestine, uh, and we used nanostrin for this. On the left, you see the pattern of those genes in vaginally delivered intestines, in the, in the intestines of babies vaginally delivered. A lot of the top genes are on, mostly, and the bottom are off. Then you find in the C-section is the opposite. Genes that should be on are off and vice versa. When we look at the fostering, we already see some abnormality. Half of the six, three of the six mice had a normal uh, profile of gene expression in the intestine, but the other had show some perturbation. Although there was no phenotype except, except in males, remember there was an a intermediate. Restoration does not normalize at all. Restoration looks like C-section. So restoration is normalizing the microbiota, normalizing uh, at least partially the growth, but not the intestinal gene expression. Marty's group has shown that antibiotics have the same obesogenic effect. Um, he's, in his very highly cited paper in 2014, he has shown how antibiotics increase fat mass and body weight. So we think that basically any perinatal perturbation on the early microbiota that affects the assembly will lead to increased pathways of fat deposition. If you think it, it kind of makes sense because it's like nature is detecting danger and is investing to save the baby in um, increasing pathways of growth and path, uh, fat deposition. The effects are abrogated at least partially by microbiota restoration. In our society, we practice, we use a lot of very common perinatal stressors, including the intrapartum antibiotics, even in uh, vaginal delivery, one of three women in this country, C-sections, one of three women in this country, uh, preventive ophthalmic antibiotics are placed in the eyes of babies, even if they are born by C-section, to prevent them from acquiring vaginal infections. Why do they do this on these babies? Nobody, nobody challenges the practices. They, people think antibiotics have no collateral damage. A lot of the babies have formula, at least supplementing, and there is work that shows that even supplementing formula in breastfed babies ha has an effect. And of course, babies will, be, will have antibiotics during the first year of life, uh, about 2.7 courses on average in the US and later. Why, why does it matter? And how do we think it affects the microbiota? That's where the studies comparing urban mm, societies with uh, uh, traditional societies are important. We, we did a, the first study in collaboration with Jeff Gordon and then a second study. So with Jeff Gordon, we show how the microbiota, uh, this is alpha diversity and these are four types of humans, US, has uh, the lowest microbiota in relation to the Malawi people and rural Amerindians that have been contacted. And this was uh, published originally in a paper with Jeff. And then in 2015, we published our team in Venezuela, where in a first contact expedition with a Yanomami village, 
they got swabs, and we did the microbiome analysis, and Yanomami that have no reported contact with uh, urban people or medicine have substantially higher fecal diversity in relation even to the other um, traditional Amerindians. So we think there is a strong association. This is not causation, but it's association between the level of urbanization, urban lifestyle, and lower alpha diversity in the intestine. We studied the Hadza, and this was in collaboration uh, with the people at uh, Stanford, and it was published in 2017. And the Hadza paper, which studies seasonal dietary variation and the microbiome in hunter-gatherers in Africa, has this, uh, this uh, graph that I love, because what we did was we took all the microbio fecal microbiotas that has been, had been published by the time and were available, uh, the sequences were available online, and we order them by the principal coordinate one. So this is the position that, they, that each one of the dots takes uh, on the principal coordinate one of the PCOA. And what happens when you do that is a spontaneous ordination of the countries by urban level. And I think that is pretty remarkable. So it's, uh, it's uh, locating on the left side of the coordinate jungle savanna peoples, our Yanomami uncontacted, first contact, uh, first reported contact are on the, are the top, at the top, then isolated people, regardless of the, um, of the um, continent, South America or Africa, then the rural group, regardless of continents, then the urban group having Japan on the left and then European and American, uh, North American countries on the right. We also know that there is increasing evidence that the, my, the perturbed microbiota uh, increases disease risk, a lot of papers. And our dilemma is nicely shown in this paper by Bach. It seems that the cost of controlling infectious diseases is being an, a new kind of diseases that are related to immune malfunction. So it's a collateral damage that antimicrobial practices are doing uh, on the education of the immune system so that all these diseases have in common inflammation. So what can we do about it? How can we reverse the trend? So we have to understand that we need to respect our biology, because even if we are highly technological, we are a product of evolution, and we need to understand why, what is important, how to wire our systems appropriately, especially in the early ages. So we can become more natural, go back, do more research on how to control pain during labor. I don't see much research on that, and I think fear of pain is, is one of the main reasons of uh, C-sections by choice. Of course, skin-to-skin, -skin, direct lactation, um, mother with the babies, uh, more, you know, we need support from society to, to, to do that, accommodate moms. Uh, our, the posterior, the secondary exposure to the environment of toddlers could be more natural. We could live in more natural houses made of natural materials, have more trees, green cities. That seems to be coming. But we are already depleted. So restoration might be needed. If we lost diversity, that is important. If we lost functions, that are important. So we will need restoration and the proper diet to sustain that diversity. So we, we need to continue association studies, correlation between uh, the ecosystems and uh, disease. Uh, uh, studies to, that look for effect of restoring, restoration and phenotypes uh, of the diseases. And we need to do a lot of work on evolution. Why are we 
the way we are. How did we come to be who we are? Why do we need what microbes? What are the ancestral microbes that monkeys have or ancestral mammals have or non-mammals have or insects have that have uh, been selected throughout evolution? <coughs> so we have an initiative. Um, it's called uh, the Microbiota Vault. It's a global microbiota vault to conserve the future of healthy humanity. If we don't do this, by the time we know what the microbes are for and why, what are the protective ones, uh, there won't be traditional peoples who carry them. They are transculturating and urbanizing at a, at a very high uh, speed. So we published recently in Science this um, perspective. And the idea would be if with industrialization we have lost diversity that is associated with this increase in diseases, can we regain, uh, restore, uh, use ecological restoration and then decrease the risk of those diseases? So this will need the collaboration of many disciplines from anthropology, nutrition, public health, immunology, vets, genomics, bioinformatics, uh, chemists, uh, and but we think it's doable. And the need is to preserve before we lose that diversity. And then when we understand what are the functions that were lost or that are being lost, then be able to restore. I want to thank my lab and uh, uh, who people who mostly uh, graduate students who have uh, been uh, working very hard to make this work possible, and collaborators who are my collaborators for many years and without whom we couldn't advance much. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. OK, do we have any questions? When you were speaking about the donor mice, was it implied that the mothers did not survive post-C-section and then they were then fostered by other mothers? And if so, what were they fed? And is that a possible factor in some of the differences in BMI of the mice? So the mothers, uh, the mothers survive the C-section, but the pups don't. The mother uh, kills the pups or abandons them. There is no bonding. Uh, we tried C-sections from the back because at the beginning we thought, of course, we are doing the C-section where the teeth are and it's painful to breastfeed. So let's do it on the side, on the back. We, couldn't, we gave analgesia. The mice reject the C-section born. So what we had to do is uh, pre get two mice pregnant with one day difference. And as soon as the first one gave birth, we did C-section in the other and swapped the babies. So, and the diet was always normal chow in any, in all cases. Thanks for that talk. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering what effect the postpartum um, practices have on the microbiota. And just, I don't know if, I'm presuming there is cultural differences between that as well. And just anecdotally, I know my niece was born in South Africa and babies are just scrubbed until they're pink after birth. And I'm from the Netherlands where you just don't touch a baby at all after birth. So what's the effect on the microbiota on that practice? I don't think that has been properly studied. I haven't studied that, but you're right. There are diverse uh, practices. In general, even in, you know, I think Europe is more respectful of natural ways there are less C-sections, especially in Scandinavian countries and, and in Holland. Um, they practice more skin to skin. They breastfeed more. So I think it's just education uh, and, and respect. Uh, they are very conservative using antibiotics, although they use. But in general, Western societies separate babies and mothers. Even in Europe and even in Scandinavia, newborns are put to sleep you know, far from their parents in a clean room. Uh, then we use technology to monitor the baby. Uh, the baby doesn't sleep with the mother. 
and indeed that's uh, uh, is recommended against. Uh, I personally think it's not the right uh, recommendation. Um, in traditional cultures, what you see is that babies and moms never separate. The baby eats ad libitum, so the baby is never hungry because when the baby wakes up and is hungry, the the mother hangs the baby in the front when they are tiny, and then in the back when they are bigger, and they go to work with the baby in the front or in the back. So the life of the mother doesn't change that much, except that she has an ectoparasite. <laughs> uh, and she deals with that until the baby is, you know, mature, has, the, you know, mature the brain, locomotion, sensorial, to be able to start crawling and, and walking around. Uh, I think in our society we uh, separate the babies from the mothers too much, even if we don't wash them after birth. But uh, I think from the 50s to the 80s, in this country also, babies were extensively washed. They were all uh, bottle fed in the hospitals. That has changed, but uh, I can tell you that in Puerto Rico it's still the practice. Babies are bathed with uh, soap and bottle fed in the nursery. You showed this um, study where you did partial restoration of the microbiota, but it didn't quite change the um, gene expression profile in intestines. So could you clarify what your conclusion was that? So is that that partial restoration is sufficient or the gene expression is more important. So partial, the, the microbiota restoration, which was quite, was not partial, was quite, so if you expose newborns to vaginal microbes, they will uh, engraft and colonize. And we see an effect on the phenotype. The effect on the growth is, uh, it, it's, uh, it protects from a ex ex excessive um, fat deposition at least partially. In females, it, it prote in males, it protects completely. You can't tell apart the vaginally born from the restore, but in females, it's partial. So it's higher than the normal, but lower than C-section in any case. So that's the growth phenotype. When we look at the intestinal gene expression, restoring the microbes does not normalize. So we don't know what that means. It's just a fact. Um. Quick question. Uh, what do we know about uh, seasonal variation in traditional societies and how that changes uh, skin microbes or, or whatever kind of microbes are colonizing the host? And how might that potentially interact with babies that are born at different times of the year? Does that affect different aspects of microbial metabolic organization if there's different microbes during different seasons? Like That's a, a very good season? question. So there are seasonal variations, not in the Amazon. The Amazon is it rains all year, and you have uh, the resources all year. It's, it's you know, it's a, uh, it's a very pretty constant environment. But in Africa, there are marked seasonal um, uh, periods. And that's what the Hatsa paper is about, because the diet changed drastically, because the resources change. What is the effect on the babies that are born at different times? I don't think anybody has done that study, but it's would be an, an interesting one. I feel like I'm out. <laughs> Thank you. This is a great talk. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any insights into whether the effect of the microbes on the phenotype is something more direct with as far as like how they maybe are affecting nutrient absorption or indirect with how the relationship between microbes and things like your endocrine or immune signaling that might be mediating then how you're... That, those are the questions we have now. So we are trying to study mechanisms and so we need to take samples and study pre-phenotype. Because once you have a, an excessive body weight, an overweight, then you will find the corresponding phenotype. But what is changing before we see it, before it's you know, in the phenotype that we observe outside. So, uh, you know, phenotyping pre-excess body weight, what, is, what are the cytokines, hormonal levels, to try to explain what, what's the mechanism. We don't know yet. Uh, 
Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about the Yanomami society. Um, it's interesting that probably Yanomami have the lowest genetic diversity in, as a human population, but have also the largest microbiome diversity. So what are the evolutionary hypotheses that you have? Maybe related something related to the environmental factors that have this microbiome? So recent genetic studies have shown that um, host genetics influence very little the micro microbiota and microbiota diversity. There are Ruth Lay studies on twins. Uh, you are right, the, my, the, the Amerindians in the Americans were, are the last of the bottlenecks of human migrations, and they are genetically very homogeneous. So what drives their high gut diversity is probably uh, has to do with the diet. Also, we think because of the uh, lifestyle, they also may have human adapted microbes that they haven't lost. So we think it's not only the diet, uh, but the capability to transmit the human microbes uh, generation after generation. The diet is important to drive to keep the diversity high. Natural diets drive, are very diverse chemically and, you know, substrates, so they drive high diversity. Um, studies by Iran Elinav and Justin uh, Sonnenberg have shown the effects of diet, and you can drive extinctions just with high-fat diet. By the time, uh, after prolonged high-fat high diet, if you get fiber, you don't get the same alpha diversity anymore. You have you you really lose um, diversity. So that has implications for future generations. And related to that is the observation that uh, the diversity has dropped really in the last 70 years. Uh, there are multiple uh, studies that show that this is a time when um, the increase in in these uh, immune-associated diseases is happening. So we think it's something that we started doing in the last seven decades, and that is global, urban, urban and that societies that are transculturating and becoming industrial are uh, following those pathways much faster. Because, you know, for a Yanomami to move to a town in the next generation that the next generation will be urban or rural. Uh, so, a uh, lots of questions without answer. Thanks for a great talk again. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, what if anything is known about the interactions among the bacterial populations and yeast populations in, in early um, childhood and even beyond in terms of uh, health and yeast, and then you said yeast and uh -huh. bacteria. Fungi? Yeah, because uh -huh. you know we we often focus just on the bacteria when we're talking about the microbiome, but they're having all these um, trophic interactions with yeast too, and vice versa. And the second question is: um, Is there anything known about? how um, the preparation and or consumption of fermented foods affects the stability of the microbiome and transmission of microbiome over generations? Uh, so the first question about the fungi, I, I think that's an area where we need more work. We did a little bit, and we have one paper on the babies and restoration. We didn't find any yeast arrive, and regardless mode of birth, um, maybe we didn't have power to to do any, you know, to ar arrive to any conclusion. Um, I think that's a we we focus on bacteria also because bacteria are older. The you know the real drivers of the planet are bacteria. They were there first, so we think we tend to think that bacteria are more important in modulating um, the host uh, physiology as well. But you are right, they interact with, uh, not only with fungi, in these uh, traditional societies, they have also e eukaryotic parasites. Viruses also, of course. And vir yeah. Uh, so do presence of, um, of helminths and protozoa 
increase diversity? Probably, but we haven't done controlled experiments. The second is fermented food. Fermented, I, have, I, I don't work on that, but I've read papers that show uh, beauty rate benefits um, from fermented foods or from anything. And apparently anything that produces beauty rate is, seems to be beneficial, anti-inflammatory. Uh, but that's not my, really my field of work. Oh, great presentation, thank you. On your data on C-section and vaginal delivery, delivery and re-inoculation, do you also have data on formula versus breastfeeding, and is that a confounding factor <coughs> that separates also the microbial communities? Yeah, so we control for, for that. We encourage all mothers to uh, breastfeed. So we have a bigger study of 84 babies followed by a year that we still haven't published. We cannot, we cannot control for that, but just uh, at the analysis level. So we ask the mothers if they um, use formula or not. And formula has a big impact. Uh, and recently, uh, we have, we read in um, the paper by, um, what's her name? Me Azad. Uh, and, and on the child cohort in Canada, that how important, how differences are or also observed in uh, express milk versus direct breastfeeding. So diet is important. Introduction of solids, it can vary from, some moms are giving solids at four months and some moms at six or seven months. So you can control for that, uh, but the point is that the marker populations our remain bacteroides is low across regardless of of other uh, impacts. Uh, so I think you know we need bigger studies really to better understand and control for those confounders. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.